Let me start off this by saying that I'm not a horror guy, and for me, the two criteria that I was comfortable with was if either A, if it had some action in it, as I could preoccupy less with being scared and focus more on the fun factor, and B, if it was B-horror, where the low budget gave the film a very corny yet endearing energy. But lately I've been craving for more, and as I've gotten older and more quote-unquote brave, I wanted to step out of my comfort zone and experience something more out there. This is not to say I've never really stepped outside of my comfort zone, as Alien Isolation is one of my favorite horror games ever, as it beautifully captures the lo-fi aesthetic and the menacing nature of the xenomorph. Jumping off that and more other experiences like the IT, REC and Paranormal Activity films, my taste in horror started developing towards more disturbing and anxiety inducing, where I knew jump scares aren't cheaply used sporadically, but the sense of dread always had me clutching my chest throughout the entire thing, and I'm kinda happy this is the case, as weird as it sounds for me. And thankfully, all of this work somewhat prepared me for the Resident Evil series, where anything goes when it comes to bioterrorism, political affairs, and boulder punching agents. More specifically, I started with Resident Evil 7, as one of my best friends actually pushed me into playing it, and I'll admit that I had a hard time with it. Not because of gameplay or difficulty, but because I, it was genuinely scary, to the point where sometimes I had to turn off the audio so I could focus solely on the objective and not immerse myself. But I eventually came around in subsequent replays, and to this day, it's the entry I really have fond memories over. Throughout the years I've been mostly playing mainline entries, like RE2 and 3 Remake, the first RE game which I actually never finished, and most recently RE5 and 6, which unironically and as polarizing as it may sound, I genuinely think Resident Evil 6 is a perfect game when it comes to co-op, which I'll someday talk about. Both Resident Evil 4 and 5 specifically remain the black sheep in the series for me, due to the controls, as silly as it sounds. I just made up the conception that they were too clunky for someone like me, and I'd always avoid playing them, but it all changed this year, as I played RE5 co-op with my buddy Expert7, which by the way, y'all should give his channel a look, as I felt that playing it with another person would reduce the hindrance of the controls and the inherited limitation of the movement, which spoke true to some extent, and in the end it resulted into an enjoyable experience, even the QTEs and cutscenes that can be equally both hilarious and frustrating. Oh, are you fucking with me? <laughs> So, now the only one left was Resident Evil 4, and what eventually pushed me was the announcement of the remake. So, over the last week or so, I've been playing the game. And I've even streamed it live on Twitch, which, by any chance if you're curious, I have the stream VODs over on my second channel, at Frank and Archive. And I must say I was very wrong about the controls, maybe due to the warm-up I had with RE5, but more than that, the entire experience felt like a roller coaster, an enthralling and sometimes frustrating one, but on the minimal, as everything else clicked perfectly, from the game design and presentation, to more specific ones like the general gameplay, and today I really want to talk about my experience with the game. So before I start I would like to address the big elephant in the room, the controls. Before RE4, 3D games were in the Wild West era, where before the presence of structure and tried and true formulas existed, devs were trying to figure out the best way to present their games, and along the years, a few standout titles marked significant shifts in gaming as a whole. For example, GTA 3 with its shift to a 3D open world with a more open-ended approach to mission design, or Halo Combat Evolved's adoption of the dual-stick format for movement and aiming. We've been slowly but surely coming up with clever solutions to our problems. But RE4 is much more different than this, as the series has always been 3D. Instead, its major shift was a change from fixed cameras to an over-the-shoulder camera, where shooting is laser accurate and with the final result you can feel the shift it brought to games pretty much establishing THE template for modern third-person shooters. My only beef was the tank controls though. Whenever I look at gameplay of RE4, the tank controls always came off as clunky and unintuitive, having it be that restricting. But I had that mindset because at the time, I've already experienced so many other shooters that I've learned from RE4 and that I've been pushing the bar in that structure, 
with that said evolution being my starting point. Heck, I was 3 years old when RE4 came out, so allow it please. Having played the game now, oh well, I couldn't be more wrong than I was because not only is the entire game designed around the movement as it was still survivor horror-esque in the style of past games, but having it be run and gun would make most of the challenge easy and besides, it was a natural evolution for the series stop and shoot game loop. This goes back to my thought of process as I thought RE4 would be this game of tank controls mixed with an advanced enemy AI that would flank you and make your life miserable like the Uncharted games for example, which is less than ideal. I'm glad I eventually got all over it as the game progressed though, because I was getting pretty comfortable with the controls by chapter 3 and the rest of the game had me really intrigued which I want to talk about more. What immediately stood out for me was the presentation, more specifically the mood. I have a real fondness for older video games, especially ones that are visually clear compared to most modern games, and not just the simplicity, but the other charm of the polygonal limitations of the hardware if that makes sense. Going from the village through the castle and then the island, it all felt really cohesive and immersive and never once did it feel like the game hadn't committed to all aspects of said atmosphere. Set simplicity is a really underrated part nowadays because you always get a clear visual language of the many different types of enemies present in a room and the type and the items they drop, which is further emphasized with glowing indicators and many others. The environments are also hushed, letting the surrounding sound wash me with both anxiety, peacefulness and dread throughout a myriad of scenarios. One of my favorite moments and things I would always look forward to in every chapter was meeting the merchant, which is so weird in a sense because of all the freaky things present in these Las Plagas infested region, a shady looking dude standing next to a blue flame with the deepest and raspiest voice gives me the most comfort alongside the soothing music, which is a very lovely contrast. The sound design is also very poignant, full of punchy weapon sounds to enemies which is varied. I gotta point out something real quick, but I bet the voice sessions for the Ganados and the Los Illuminados must have been funny because there's no way you're going to tell to my face the phrases Quiero tu cabeza, te voy a matar, and Un forastero in those corny ass voice tones and not have me laugh because seriously, even though the game tries aiming for a serious tone sometimes, the cheesiness adds to the nature of the already ridiculous roller coaster right up ahead, specifically starting from the castle. Another cool aspect about the music is that it serves as a strong signifier of the enemy presence and how completely quiet it goes once you complete an encounter, which is very useful. My only criticism has more to do with the porting quality, specifically the PS4 version rather than the game itself, where, where some visual elements are either bugged or glitched and haven't seen any fixes since launch, like the rifle animation being locked at 30 FPS when the entire game runs at 60, but other than that, the experience has remained smooth from start to finish. Back when I mentioned that the game was designed around the movement, it wasn't just the combat, but every facet of its design serves to accommodate it. In combat, for example, when you're far from enemies, they'll slowly walk towards you, and if you aim, they'll start dashing until reaching a certain distance where they'll start walking again, giving you ample time to line up your shots. A very considerate choice that gets better when player agency kicks in, and you can create various strategies around it, like throwing grenades to take out an entire group, lining up enemies to blast them with a shotgun or a rifle shot, and you can even make use of certain context sensitive moves like shooting in the head or a leg followed by a kick or a suplex, to environmental props to take them out like barrels and bear traps. There are also more specific ones attached to a certain scenario like a lava pit or a crane that drops enemies into a waste disposal which is funny. While we're at it, the boss encounters are also very fun being varied and having a clear distinction visually and mechanically, as the game doesn't usually show health bars and indicator as to when a boss is close to dying. The major signifier here are the different phases, but at some point it can get tedious when you dump a ton of bullets to an enemy and they seem unfazed due to the lack of obvious clues to point that out. So as a rule of thumb, make sure to always take a rocket launcher with you, as in most cases they'll one-shot them and make your life significantly easier. For level design, levels are both very straightforward and expansive when it needs to be for combat and puzzles. 
exploration of resources is also a big aspect as it fuels back to combat and resource management in them, as well as discovering treasures that can be sold for money or combined for an increased price. When it comes to actually moving within them, there are not many obstacles in your path as the game's only worry at that point is to get you from point A to point B without much struggle. But when it opens up, like the village for example, it takes into account the limitations of your movement by offering automatic actions like jumping or climbing stairs. Later chapters can get very elaborate and complex, like the castle and the island becoming more demanding of your problem solving skills and adjusting accordingly, and that's all fine, but it can get really ridiculous at times, especially when you have to protect Ashley from time to time. Now, to the game's credit, you don't even spend more than 50% of your journey protecting Ashley, as she gets kidnapped multiple times and you're back to just Leon alone. But in the moments you do have to protect her, it only becomes a nuisance when multiple enemies surround you and you're in a frantic chase to get rid of all of them and avoid having Ashley get taken away. It's also not that difficult of a task as you can command her to wait in certain spots or ask her to hide in dumpsters to make your life easier. Having said that, Ashley calling Leon for help gets super aggravating when she says it non-stop like, honestly, her screaming, Leon, help, has become ingrained in my mind and I don't think I'll ever erase that from my memory, but it sounds funny looking back though. I don't think this is mentioned enough, but sometimes the game design gives off a very arcade-like energy at times, similar to Sega and older Namco titles, where even though the general gameplay loop is built around the action survival horror moniker, you'll have some very video game as video game moments like the insane QTEs that come in about from time to time, or the very involved set pieces like the minecart and the speedboat at the end. It's that level of mission variety that gives the game a rollercoaster feel, making the entire pacing tight and concise and rarely having moments that stretch themselves too thin, as if you're watching an action movie. Not counting the island though, as that whole section is its own weird thing to make sense of, to be honest. As dandy as this all sounds, I just have to come out and admit that at the end of the day, movement can become very cumbersome, only when I needed to make minor adjustments like strafing from side to side or other finer adjustments. And yes, I'm fully aware of everything I just discussed and I even stand by every word as I really enjoyed my time with the game. But the tank controls, especially in this perspective, is just a thought I can't stop to think of, as I've been so used to so many third person shooters that allow me to aim and move at the same time. It's just ingrained in me at this point and I'll have to leave with that. The story is very bizarre. Nothing about its quality, as it does the job, but more so how it gets more nonsensical and ridiculous the further you progress. I don't hate it, as I'm fond of campy storytelling. It's just that the shift is so jarring and weird as you spend the first hours in the village trying to figure out what's going on and what happened, and once you get into the castle, that's when it hits the fan. From a free cult Monsters who show more advanced mutation of the Plaga, a 20 year old weirdo who has a right hand that comes off, an ex-partner thought to be dead now alive and betraying you, and just more and more information that funnily enough completely gets you interested no matter how crazy it can get. As for the characters, I really like all of them, Leon with his one liners and action hero energy. Ashley is often annoying but endearing energy as she hypes Leon whenever he succeeds. Luis, who I wish had more screen time because every time he's on the screen I really love his presence, but having him killed off felt pretty sudden. The ever mysterious Ada that only plays according to her rules, and the enemies as well, such as Salazar with his childish and cartoonish mannerisms and Sadler to some extent as he's a very zero shits given character and rarely clapping back at anyone who gives him some snarky energy which is cool. With all my thoughts put forward, do I think RE4 is an amazing game? Very much so. Is it a masterpiece and one of the greatest of all time? I'm kinda iffy on that one, because to truly feel the impact of the game, I believe that you had to be there to experience it and feel the shift it caused. I wasn't there, so the game doesn't speak as highly to me as it does to many people who played it when it came out. The one thing I can feel is understanding the impact it had and picture the timeline shift from pre-RE4 to post-RE4 and the impact it left on the gaming industry as a whole, which is something worth acknowledging. 
With all that said, I can't believe it took me this long to play RE4 because even among the minor nuances, I had a blast playing through it and I can't wait to sink my teeth into the remake on the way. And as they say, better late than never. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe, share it with your friends and activate the bell so you can get notification of my latest video and as for me, I gotta get this armor core video done cause it's been 2 months already.